the mind has a very deep habit. There's a little question inside that keeps getting asked over and over again, what do I do next, what do I do next? And if you come up with a lot of different answers, the mind gets scattered and feels fearful. And so for the next hour, try to convince yourself that there's only one thing you really have to do is stay with the breath and then work with the breath. Explore the breath energies in your body. Notice where you can feel the in-breath, where you feel the out-breath. What you can do to breathe in a way that's more comfortable. And in doing that, try not to put too much pressure on the breath to change it. Often the best way to change it is just simply think of the breath doing different things from what it's normally doing. And you'll see that the power of the mind, the power of that perception can actually change the way you breathe. So think of the body as a big sponge. Something wide open. So the breath energy can come in and out from any direction. And as you hold that perception in mind, see how the body responds. And then as the question comes up again, what next? Well, what next is the same thing again and again and again. And if you stick with it long enough, you'll find that you can get deeper and deeper into concentration. It requires some intelligence. You can't just say, well, just stay with the breath and force it down. You have to use your ingenuity. You have to use your powers of observation to notice what kind of breathing you like, what kind of changes in the breath you'll find interesting. Now you can explore the body in different parts of the body to get to know the parts of the body that you may have been ignoring and see how you can nourish them and see how they reward you as they get nourished. All this comes under that one heading. What next? Stay with the breath. But of course the mind has other agendas as well. It'll tell itself, well this is just a diversion or this is not all that important. I've got other things I've got to think about now. Here again, you have to use your discernment, especially the part of the mind that tends to worry about the future. You've got to remind yourself the best thing you can do for the future is to develop your mind. After all, what is the worst thing that could happen in the future? Most of us will say, well, you die. You know, just die. A worse death would be one that was long, drawn out, and painful. But the Buddha says there are things that are worse than death. When you do unskillful things, hold to wrong views. That can lead to pain and suffering beyond death, and it can last for many lifetimes. What are your best protections against doing unskillful things? Well, there's a list of qualities that the Buddha calls the seven noble treasures, qualities of mind that you develop that you can really depend on in the future, that will protect you from doing the things that would cause harm to yourself and harm to others, and have long-term bad effects. You develop these qualities in the same way that traders on Wall Street have their, what they call, nut, like a squirrel, because they all know that the the system is very fragile. It could collapse at any time, and they figure out there must be some way to put their money in something that doesn't depend on the fragility of the system. Well, money, of course, is not safe. There's a great passage in the canon where they talk about how you bury a treasure away underground, and it can get destroyed by water, it can get destroyed by under underground animals. Someone else might dig it up. One of my favorite lines in that is that Nagas might take it away. So even your nut, if that's the kind of nut it is, is not going to be all that safe. But the qualities of your mind are safe. Nobody else even has to know about them, and they're yours. And they really do protect you against the big danger in life, i.e. wrong views and wrong actions. Four of the elements in this list relate directly to action. First there's conviction. 
Traditionally, this is conviction and the Buddha's awakening. And that translates into the principle that he gained awakening through his own efforts. He really did find the deathless happiness. And the qualities he had to develop in the course of perfecting his skills and using his own efforts were qualities that we all have in potential form. He simply took those potentials and he developed them. That means that we can develop our potentials too. That's one of the implications of his awakening. The other implication, of course, is his insight into karma in the course of the, of the awakening. That there really is a continuity from one life to the next, and it's through your actions. You can't say, well, I was born in America this lifetime, and I want to be born in America the next lifetime. That's not for sure. You can't necessarily keep the same gender. You can't necessarily keep the same background. or You certainly can't keep your possessions. When you die, it's like a trap door opening. All things you've depended on around which you build your identity here, they go. And so what's going to receive you under the trap door? Well, the actions you've done. So this leads directly to the next three qualities, virtue, shame, and compunction. Virtue, of course, is a matter of the precepts. You make up your mind you're not going to harm anybody under any circumstances, with an emphasis on the any. Of course, you can think about what could happen. Say civilization collapses. Or you read stories about people in war and some of the horrible things they suddenly find themselves doing because they feel that the, the, the push of poverty, the push of hunger. make them things, do things that they would never do in ordinary circumstances. And you have to ask yourself, are you immune to those kinds of pressures? This is one of the reasons why the precepts are kept simple. No killing, no stealing. They don't have a lot of exemptions. They don't have a lot of explanations. They're just quick, easy to remember. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no intoxicants. You keep those in mind, and you look at yourself in the course of an ordinary life. Do you have trouble keeping the precepts? If that's the case, what are you going to do when things get really tough? You've got to develop the qualities of mind that will help toughen your precepts, make, make you more reliable, because this is probably the biggest thing to be worried about, the biggest fear we should have about the future, so we can't depend on ourselves. So one of the ways of developing a more dependable attitude is to develop the next two qualities, i.e. a sense of shame and a sense of compunction. Shame here is not the debilitating shame that psychiatrists are making all their money off of. It's a healthy shame that comes from the sense of your own self-esteem. Okay? You're a good person, honorable person. Certain kinds of behavior are beneath you. And you would be ashamed to do them. So you're not saying you're a bad person, you're actually saying you're a good person, but you'd have a sense of shame around doing things that would go against yourself, a genuine self esteem. This is a good protection. The next one, compunction. This is a word we don't use much, and it's kind of sad that we don't use it much. The British meaning is you feel guilty about something afterwards, but here we're talking about the American meaning, which is that you think about doing something, you say, no, I just wouldn't feel right doing that. You'd be afraid of the consequences. You might say it's the opposite of apathy. It's a sense of having some moral scruples. And this kind of fear is the kind of fear that the Buddha actually encourages, the fear of doing something unskillful. There are a lot of other fears. We're talking today at the Sutta about the fears of animals in the jungle. Or right here we've got snakes, we've got bobcats. Bobcats aren't all that scary, but snakes are pretty scary sometimes. The fear of earthquakes, the fear of what's out there in the dark. Those kinds of fears the Buddha doesn't encourage that you develop. He does encourage you to develop the fear of doing something that's going to be unskillful, that's going to cause harm. 
So you want to exercise that fear. Our society is one that tends to poo-poo that. They encourage you to do all kinds of unskillful things. And if you have any sense of shame or conscience around that, they accuse you of not being a real man or not being tough enough or whatever. That's a very unhealthy culture we've got. Then you notice that one of the big enemies of shame and compunction, well, actually the two big ones, one is anger. When anger comes up, you can drop it can push those attitudes out of the way. It wants to do what it wants to do. It feels justified in doing it and doesn't want to hear anything else. And if you that, add that with some intoxicants, then shame and compunction, you just go by the board. So these four qualities of conviction, virtue, shame, and compunction all go together, and they should strengthen one another. These are real treasures. Because they keep you from doing things that you later regret. I remember hearing over the radio one time a, a Vietnam vet. Here it is, what now? Fifty some years after the war, remembering a young Vietnamese girl that he'd killed. And he said he thinks about her every night. And the memory is driving him crazy. And he would give a million dollars to be able to go back and undo that act. We can't go back and undo the things you've done in the past. But if you can have an attitude that will prevent you from doing those things to begin with, see how much it's worth. A skillful action doesn't mean just avoiding unskillful things, but it also means doing skillful things. And this is what the next treasure is about, i.e. generosity. The willingness to give, seeing that you've got something, and it doesn't have to necessarily be a material thing. It can be you, you give of your time, you give of your experience, you give of your energy, you give forgiveness. And this itself is a real treasure, because it creates a really good state of mind. The state of mind says, you know, I have more than enough. And that's a wealthy state of mind. And it's a state of mind that is a lot less likely to do the kinds of things that would cause you to break the precepts. Then there's learning. You learn about right view. You learn about all the teachings of the Dharma as best you can. You don't have to learn all of them, but you learn enough to give yourself guidance. It's one of the reasons why we chant so often, because these phrases get into your head. And they'll pop up sometimes when you right when you need them. Reflections on the body, reflections on aging, illness, and death, reflections on what is a true friend, what's not a true friend. I mean there are reasons why these passages were chosen by a John So What. And that we chant them so often because they should get burned into your mind. So there when you need them. Finally, there's discernment. As John Lee says, this is probably the most important one of the list. Because he says you can be lacking in other things, but as long as you have discernment. Of course, here he means discernment that's nurtured by proper conviction and virtue and all the others. But if you have discernment, you can set yourself up in life, even if you lack other things. And if you lack discernment, you may be sitting right over gold and you can't make any use out of it. If you have discernment, you may be just living in a place with nothing but grass and dirt, but you can make something out of that grass and dirt and you can turn it into gold. In other words, you learn how to look at your mind, see what's wrong with it, but also see what potentials there are for what's right with it. And you learn how to develop those potentials, even in the face of what seemed to be overwhelming odds. I mean, look at the forest of Johns. Most of them were the sons of peasants. And yet that didn't stop them from gaining awakening. It was because they had discernment. They developed their discernment. 
So these are your treasures. These are the things that will keep you safe, regardless of what happens in the future. In particular, they keep you safe from the biggest danger, the worst thing that could happen to you, i.e. that you develop a wrong view and you start acting in ways that are going to be harmful to yourself and others, and the results of that are going to go lasting for a long, long time. So remember, when you start feeling fear about the future, ask yourself, well, what are the, the appropriate things to fear? And if you get your priorities straight, that's a treasure right there. <laughs>